This presentation is brought to you by the Friends of the Amazing Facts Ministry. If you're a believer, that means you've made a decision you want to go to heaven. That means that your worldview, Jesus, is the most important thing to you. Why in the world would you think about making the most important decision in your life about marrying somebody who does not make Jesus the center of their life? If I were to ask you, who in the Bible do you think of if I were to talk about the smartest person who has ever lived, who would that be? Solomon. If I was to ask you to tell me in the Bible who is the person that had the greatest patience in suffering, who would that be? Job. And if I were to say who in the Bible was the physically strongest, who would that be? Samson is the one people think of when they think of who is the physically strongest man who ever lived. And we're going to be talking in the next couple of presentations about Samson and what we can learn about uh, walking the Christian walk, about our Savior, and what other lessons the Lord might have for us in His Word from that. Uh, you'll find the story of Samson in the book of Judges. If you go to the book of Judges, chapter 13, Samson is the last of the judges mentioned. Now, some believe that uh, Samuel is among the judges, but you don't get to Samuel till you get to the book of Samuel. But in the book of Judges, Samson is the last judge that is mentioned. Uh, most scholars believe there were approximately 12 judges. And um, four chapters in the book of Judges are dedicated just to Samson. A very interesting character. And it even was foretold in the book of Genesis when Jacob was blessing his sons it told us that from the tribe of Dan, which is where Samson came from, it said Dan will judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. As a matter of fact, the name Dan means judge, and uh, the name Daniel means Jehovah is my judge, or Elohim is my judge. And so Samson was from the tribe of Dan. Now, if you turn in your Bibles to the book of Judges, we're just going to read it. And um, I believe... There's things that God wants to say to you today that I know nothing about. I believe that there's inherent power of the Word of God that as I read through this story, the Lord is going to speak to different people maybe in different ways because there's power in the Word of God to do that. Amen? Chapter 13, Judges, verse 1. Again, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. There are about seven apostasies mentioned in the book of Judges. This is the seventh of them. And the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Philistines for 40 years. Now there was a certain man from Zorah of the family of the Danites, whose name was Manoah. And his wife was barren and had no children. And the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said unto her, Indeed now you are barren, and you've borne no children, but you will conceive and bear a son. Now therefore, please be careful not to drink wine or any similar, that means strong drink, and do not eat anything unclean. For behold, you will conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come upon his head. For the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb, and he will begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines." You notice how often God raises someone up during times of great adversity. When was Moses chosen? Time of great oppression and adversity. And uh, you'll see people like Daniel comes at uh, times of great adversity and oppression. Elijah, time of great adversity and oppression. Prophets of God are being persecuted. Jesus, the Romans were ruling the world. A time of great oppression. So Samson, during this time of national oppression, the people are praying to God. God answers the prayer by raising someone up. And usually these people that God has raised up during times of oppression to deliver His people are types of Christ. Flawed though they may be on the human side, you'll see things in there. For one thing, a promised son, a supernatural visitation of the angel that's given. 
something like Ishmael and Isaac and John the Baptist. Someone said, great men are born for times of great oppression. And now the instruction that the angel gives, have you ever wondered before, was well, Samson strong because he was just bigger than everyone else and he was real beefy muscles, just hard as a rock? Or was it nothing to do with that? And I've heard theories all over the place. If you saw Samson, did he look stronger than other people? Was there something different about him physically? Well, when Delilah starts to give him a hard time, she says, what is the secret of your strength? And you would think that if he had great big old Schwarzenegger muscles that the secret of his strength would have been obvious. He was big muscles. But there's something else they didn't understand. But then again, if there was nothing physical about the strength of Samson, then why did the angel come and go to such great lengths to tell the mother, be very careful in your prenatal care? Because God is going to do something extraordinary with this baby and you need to take care of yourself. So what the angel said to the wife of Manoah is just for, not for the wife of Manoah, but every expecting mother and father need to realize their habits and health are reproduced in the children. And they got to be careful. They've learned now, you know, DNA is a very interesting science. And uh, they've discovered that your DNA is not the same from the time you're born to when you die. Your DNA changes through your life by your lifestyle, behavior, exposure, your diet, it will alter your DNA. Your DNA can actually be altered and so what you're doing affects your DNA that will then be reproduced in your children. Because we've heard before that sometimes a parent's habits can be inherited. Some things can actually be inherited tendencies. So you want to be careful to take care of your health because you may pass it on to the third or fourth generation. So it says here that he would be a Nazarite. What is a Nazarite? Turn in your Bible to the book of Numbers chapter 6. And uh, there's some interesting information here and I'm not going to read it all. But you need to understand this to understand something about Samson and to understand something about where he kind of meandered a little bit. And the Lord spoke to Moses, I'm in number 6 verse 1, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When either a man or a woman consecrates an offering to take the vow of a Nazarite to separate himself to the Lord, he shall separate himself from wine and similar or strong drink. He shall drink neither vinegar made from wine or vinegar made from similar drink. Neither shall he drink any grape juice, meaning fresh, new wine, or eat fresh grapes or raisins. All the days of his separation he will eat nothing that is produced from the grapevine. He was supposed to stay out of the vineyard. Now that comes up later. All the days of his vow, the separation, no razor will come upon his head until the days are fulfilled to the Lord. He shall be holy and he'll let the locks of his hair grow. All the day that he separates himself to the Lord, he shall not go near a dead body. He will not make himself unclean for his father or for his mother, for his sister when they die because he is separated to God. Meaning, even if your family member died, father or mother, you are not to touch their body. I mean, you know, someone dies, you have to care for the body. They did for Jesus. But, you know, biblically, when you touch a dead body, you're unclean until sundown. You're supposed to wash. And that's just good sanitation rules. But if you are Nazarite, it didn't matter if it was your father, your mother, your brother, your sister. You are to be fully consecrated to God. And didn't Jesus say, he that loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And so it was saying that the Nazarite was to be fully consecrated to God. There was to be no risk that his mind was going to be affected by the wrong spirit. He is not supposed to drink wine or strong drink or anything of the sort. And so this was the Nazarite vow. Now with that in mind, we're going to delve into the second part of what happens in the next chapter. Now Samson went down to Timnah. Now Samson's growing up. You know, as he got to be a teenager, and he's an only child as far as we know, and uh, he maybe made some local friends, and he said, you know, if I just go four miles down the hill, even though the Philistines oppressed them, they saw him every day, they traded with them. He probably spoke the language, as you'll see. And through constant exchange and making friends with some of the teenagers of the Philistines, he one day his eyes saw 
a young Philistine girl, and he thought, wow, she is really pretty. And look at the sparkle and the personality, and what a beautiful girl. I find myself so attracted. So he went down, he saw a woman in Timnah of the daughters of the Philistines. Now, Samson's not that old yet, because you'll read later, it says he judges for 20 years. That hasn't happened yet, it comes later. And he's probably in his late teens, early 20s when this happens. Comes to his father and his mother, and he says, I've seen a woman in Timnah of the daughters of the Philistines. Now therefore get her for me as a wife. And his father and his mother said to him, Is there no woman among the daughters of your brethren or among my people? Look, if, if you can't find one among the Israelites or even among the tribe of Dan, that you would go get a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines. Now, I won't take this too far. There were other tribes around Israel. You had the Edomites, you had the Moabites, you had the Ammonites. They were all related to Lot. They practiced circumcision. They're, he's basically saying, you know, it, if you're going to marry outside the faith, at least marry someone that was related to Abraham that believes in Jehovah, but you're going to the uncircumcised Philistines. And that was, they thought, the worst thing that could happen. Well, Samson was, Samson was strong-minded, and he was persuasive, and, and his answer was to his mother and father, get her for me for she pleaseth me well. Here he starts to sound like a real muscle head, doesn't he? <laughs> His logic was, I just really want her. He couldn't argue with them, except to say, I want what I want. Get her for me. You don't want to miss this week's incredible free offer. Simply text your name and address to 0458-222-444 or visit amazingfacts.com.au to order online. For today's free offer, just text your name and address to 0458-222-444 or visit amazingfacts.com.au to order online. What does the Bible say about these forbidden unions? When the Lord your God brings you into the land which you go out to possess, and you cast out many nations before you, you will make no covenant with them, no sure mercy to them, nor shall you make marriages with them. You shall not give your daughter to their son, nor take their daughter for your son, for they will turn your sons away from following me to serve other gods, so the anger of the Lord God will be aroused against you to destroy you suddenly." That's very serious business. And yet it still happens. People raised in the church, they say, oh yeah, I love the Lord, I gave my heart to the Lord, and then they start dating a pagan. They start dating a Philistine. And in their mind they think, oh man, he pleaseth me well. She pleaseth me well. What a man, what a girl. I'm sure they just, a few things they don't understand about Jesus, but I'll talk to them. I'll marry them, and then I'll convert them. Or they say, I'm going to date them, and I'll give them Bible studies while we're dating. That's a bad idea. Because you'll both end up influencing each other. And you end up, it's a siphon effect. Compromises are made. If you don't like what I'm saying, friends, you take it up with the Lord. Let me give you more scripture. 1 Kings 11. But King Solomon loved many foreign women. Now, up until this point, in Kings, Solomon was on a trajectory to heaven. He, it says there in 1 Kings chapter 3, Solomon loved the Lord, walking in all the commandments of the Lord. He prayed and God gave him wisdom. God said, I'm going to bless you with wisdom and I'm going to make you rich and you're going to live long and you're going to be famous. And Solomon is going from good to better to best to excellent. He's going like that. He builds his palace. He builds a temple of the Lord and people are coming from around the world and the land is full of gold and and silver's like stones, and Queen of Sheba's left breathless. You've heard the word breathtaking? It comes from the story. Queen of Sheba says there was no more breath in her when she saw, and it's going like, like, like that, like that. And listen to what it says next. But King Solomon loved many foreign women. What do you think happened to the kingdom then? Went down. That was the turning point. He loved many foreign women as well as the daughter of Pharaoh, 
women of the Moabites and Ammonites and Edomites and Zidonians and Hittites from all the nations whom the Lord God had said to the children of Israel, you shall not intermarry with them, nor they with you. Surely they will turn away your hearts after other gods. It didn't happen overnight. And his wives turned away his heart. It was so when Solomon was old that his wives turned his heart after other gods and his heart was not loyal to the Lord God. It doesn't say he gave up on God. He just compromised. His faith was diluted. I could go on and on. There's several very clear statements in there. And of course, you've got the New Testament. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell with them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you, and I will be a father to you. You'll be my sons and my daughters. So God is telling us, if you're a believer, that means you've made a decision, you want to go to heaven. That means that your worldview, Jesus, is the most important thing to you. Am I right? Why in the world would you think about making the most important decision in your life about marrying somebody who does not make Jesus the center of their life, who has not made that person a priority, and your children? Your priorities, you'll say, you know, let's, we're going to go to church, Sabbath is a holy day, and they say, no, it's not, it's a holiday for us. Saturday, party day. Your home is divided. You're going to have a problem. You're going to want to pray. And they're going to say, no, we're going to go pay for some counseling. Or we're going to buy a book. And you're going to say, we're going to church. They say, no, we're going to the theater. We're going to church. We're going to the mall. And we're going to eat clean food. And they say, no, we're not. And you're going to find yourself trying to cook two things at one time. I'm telling you, friends, it can be rough. Now, sometimes you find the Lord and your spouse doesn't and you got a believer married to an unbeliever. Sometimes people backslide and while they're out of the church, you get uh, a believer, marries an unbeliever, and then they come back to the Lord and they, they've got to live with the results. And if you're in that situation, you're married. But why would you deliberately want to do that and go down to Timnah and marry someone outside of your faith? The devil has done more damage to dilute the effect of the gospel in the world by getting half-hearted believers who don't understand the importance of finding a life partner where Jesus is first in their life. So when you're considering somebody, the first thing you want to know is that Jesus is first for them. Don't even think about it. He said, boy, but they're really good looking and they seem so smart and they're, so, they're almost a Christian. They act like a Christian in so many other ways. They're Christian-like. <laughs> I hear all these things. They're so polite and they've got Christian morals. They're atheists. Oh, but they got Christian morals. They love humanity and I hear all these bad arguments. Don't do it. Can I get an amen? Yeah. It's because what God says. And you know what? Samson got what he wanted. Be careful what you pray for. You might get it. And then it was nothing but trouble. This created a fork in the road for his life. Instead of marrying a girl from among his people, he married a Philistine, and his whole life got off course, and it started with this. You watch and see. God had a big plan. He had more opportunity than anybody in the Bible. So Samson went down to Timnah with his father and his mother, and he came to the vineyards of Timnah. Now, what was a Nazarite supposed to do and not do? Don't have nothing to do with grapes. If you're not supposed to eat a raisin, if you're not supposed to eat a grape seed, if you're not supposed to drink any grape juice, don't walk through a vineyard. Is that a good idea? If you're an alcoholic, don't get your apple juice at the liquor store. Right? Now to his surprise, a young lion came roaring against him, and the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him. And he tore the lion apart as one would have torn apart a young goat. And he went down, he talked with a woman, and she pleased Samson well. And after some time, when he returned to get her, 
So they contracted for the marriage, and he finally returns for the wedding feast. He turns aside, he wants to go back, he says, was I dreaming? Did I really kill that lion? He turns back, and in the weeks that have gone by, the, the animals had kind of hollowed out the carcass of the lion, and within the rib cage, it says, behold, a swarm of bees and honey were in the carcass of the lion. Now, you've maybe seen bees swarm before, and, you know, they'll find a hollow log, and they could even, you know, in the cavity there of this lion, for whatever reason, they took up residence, and they had already begun making honey. And he took some of the honey in his hands, and he went along eating it. When he came to his father and money, a big pile of comb, he gave some to them, and they also ate. He did not tell them that he had taken the honey out of the carcass of a lion. Why? Because, first of all, dead bodies unclean. What was a Nazarite supposed to do? Stay out of the vineyard. Don't touch anything dead. And if you're going to touch something dead, make it a clean animal that's dead, but a lion is an unclean animal. So he's got an unclean carcass and an unclean animal, and he gets honey from it. So they went down in the wom and to, to the woman, and Samson gave a feast there for the young men used to do. So here they're having the wedding feast. And the word feast there is wine banquet. Oh, uh, you see what's happening now? Samson's compromising in that area as well. So he's down there and he's acting like the Philistines when he's with the Philistines and he has a feast. And finally he said, let me pose a riddle to you. They'll never get this. He thought, they'll never get this. And so he said to them, out of the eater came something to eat, and out of the strong came something sweet. Now, for three days, they never would have got the riddle. His parents didn't even know what happened. Nobody knew. No way anyone would ever guess that. But it came to pass on the seventh day that they said to Samson's wife. Now, notice it doesn't say fiancé. They, they were married now. Several times she's called his wife. So he did marry her. And he loved her. Entice your husband. I didn't say she loved him. Entice your husband that he might explain the riddle to us, or else we'll burn you and your father's house with fire. What are they threatening to do? Burn her. Then she explained the riddle to the sons of her people. He told her. He confided in her. She immediately betrays him. And you know, she's scared. So they say, what is sweeter than honey, and what is stronger than a lion? Samson now is so mad. He looks at his wife. He's probably looking down. So his anger was aroused. And he went back up to his father's house. He said, look, this is supposed to be the honeymoon. He said, we're married now. He says, but I am so mad at her that he storms back up to Dan and he goes back to his father's house. After a while in time, I'm in chapter 15, verse 1, of the wheat harvest, it happened that Samson visited his wife with a young goat. He starts getting lonely and he's thinking about it. And he thought, oh, well, maybe I was too angry and this is all over with. And he gets down to his father-in-law's house, and he said, yeah, I'm going to go see uh, Betsy, whatever her name was. And uh, the father would not permit him to go in. He said, no. He says, I thought you pure, purely hated her. Therefore, I gave her to the best man. And Samson said to him, this time I will be blameless regarding the Philistines if I harm them. And Samson went out, and he caught 300 foxes. And he didn't do it all in one day. And if you read some of the ancient accounts of Israel during the time, especially the hills around Judah, it was a lot more forested. There were rabbits and, and uh, small varmints, and foxes were numerous, running their foxholes everywhere. So the idea that he caught 300 foxes in that country at that time is not really that amazing. He didn't do it all in one day, but he would catch these foxes. And he says, I am going to destroy the Philistines. It's called slash and burn. If you destroy their food source, I'm going to subjugate them economically. He'd light this brand filled with pitch on fire, have it tied to two foxes' tails. You ever seen how a fox runs? That'll make a straight line. You get two foxes together, and it is just crazy zigzag. And they go rip snorting all, all around through these fields, and they're just the fields are just going up in flames. And at first they thought it was a fluke, but then day after day their fields are burning. And notice it said it was during wheat harvest. And it decimated them economically, and they're saying, Who did this? They said, who has done this? Verse 6 of chapter 15. And someone answered, Samson, the son-in-law of the Timnite, because he had taken his wife and given her to his companion. And the Philistines thought, well, that is pretty bad. Take a guy's wife and give it to his friend. And so the Philistines came up and burned her and her father with fire. You know, if she had been loyal to her husband, 
he would have protected her. But instead she sold out and the very thing she feared came upon her. Isn't that sad? Now Samson's feeling pretty lonely. His parents are upset because he wouldn't listen to them. He doesn't want to endanger his parents now that he's become a marked man with the Philistines. So he said, if I go home, they're in danger. He's lost his wife and he has no friends and he's up dwelling in a rock by himself when he decided not to do what he knew God wanted him to do and he forsook the guidance of his parents, his believing parents, and he thought that he could compromise with the enemy. Uh, everything started going sideways. You wonder how much trouble we brought into our lives because we thought, well, I know the Bible says this, but I don't have to follow that that closely. And now he's living in a, a cave all by himself, but that even in itself is a sign that uh, God's going to speak to him there. in prison and you came to me assuredly I say to you inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these my brethren you did it to me Don't forget to request today's free offer. It's sure to be a blessing. And thank you for your continued support as we take the gospel of Jesus Christ to the world. We hope you'll join us next week as we delve deep into the Word of God to explore more amazing facts. This presentation was brought to you by the Friends of the Amazing Facts Ministry.